Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, and today I am delighted to be joined by Colin Watt and Cal McFadden. Welcome, welcome to the show, guys. <laughs> welcome to you too, Paul. Um, <laughs> thanks for having us on. It's always a pleasure, Colin. And um, we're going to be talking about the only thing worth talking about this week: the Celtic Rangers game. We've been talking about it all week. We've come to Wednesday. Thankfully, uh, we're still at the COVID four. There isn't a fifth. Uh, named person who's going to be missing the game but it has been confirmed that Ryan Christie will certainly be missing it even though we have been in discussions with uh, the government health officials so what's your thoughts on that one because that seems to be the hard, the harshest one the hardest one to take it is isn't it I mean it's well you say it's not his fault but again he, he was in close proximity to someone who had it and that's that's just the general rule I mean if you're around someone, you've got to self isolate. There's there's no way of getting around it. I seen Arsenal try to do it. Don't know if you've seen it, Calum. They're talking about Kieran Tierney apparently already had it. We just didn't disclose it. I mean, they're really going to the boundaries to try and get around mm. these regulations, aren't they? Well, I think that's uh, the main challenge at the moment is the way the re regulations are set out. It's pretty clear, and as you've said, Colin, trying to get around them. I can understand it from a footballing point of view. You want your best players to to be available at all times, but. The regulations are clear and unfortunately he misses out. Yeah, and just for those that are, uh, haven't seen this face to the, the left of me before, it's not like a young Jack and Victor out the still game <laughs> title sequence. This is Callum McFadden from Football CFB. Callum actually joined me earlier for the Football Insomniac podcast, which you can um, check out on Facebook, Twitter and on YouTube, where hopefully you'll be watching this now. If you are on YouTube, give us a thumbs up. That actually really helps us get the name of the podcast out there. And we're actually only now, Paul, 60 subscribers away from 3,000. The growth over the last couple of months has just been incredible. Yeah, very impressed with that. And um, if you are watching on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel. Everything we do is free and we are broadcasting now multi-times on a daily basis. After this show, Colin, I will be joined at two o'clock by none other than Johnny Owen, who has adapted this book into a documentary. The Three Kings, if anybody's seen the trailer, it's uh, quite exciting, actually, when you look at the way that's been put together. Have, have you seen any of his previous documentaries? I haven't, but Calum, you were speaking about this earlier on, weren't you? Well, uh, for me, it's going to be very exciting to, to see this. I mean, the, the trailer looks incredible, and there was a, a famous um, documentary years ago, Hugh McIlvanny looked at some of the big characters in Scottish football and, and Scottish football management, and, mm. and for me, this looks as if it's going to be bigger and better than ever. Well, I was just uh, obviously talking to Johnny a couple of years ago uh, on a Celtic State of Mind and it's strange how these things happen because Edgar Summertime Jones the Liverpool Liverpudlian uh, musician who was up here for a, a session not that long ago introduced me to Johnny Owen because he had met at a film premiere and it was a film that had been written by Johnny called Sven Galli he was also the lead part if anybody's not seen it you should check it out it's on uh, Amazon Prime I think at the minute where he plays a band manager and he's trying to get a band to, to, to break it and make it big down in London. It's really funny, but the music's brilliant. Mm -hmm. And one of the songs that was in there was a song called Weed Bus. So you can imagine what that's about. <laughs> uh, by a band called The Stairs from the late 80s, early 90s, uh, whose lead singer was Edgar Summertime Jones, who oh, obviously okay. I uh, became friendly with over the years. So Edgar put me in touch with Johnny. Johnny is a Celtic fan as well as obviously having um, his affections for Nottingham Forest and Cardiff. And he came on the podcast and spoke very, very well and with an in-depth knowledge about Celtic, but in particular about Jock Steen. And I know from researching books that you've got a good knowledge of a certain subject, Colin, but once you actually research it, maybe for a book and you interview people around about it, your knowledge goes through the roof. And the way that Johnny was talking to me about Steen, I knew... This isn't a passing uh, interest that he has in Jock Steen. He's been researching him. So I asked him the question on the, the podcast about two years ago and there was a slight pause because he didn't want to give the game away. <laughs> but then he says, if I do make a Jock Steen documentary, you'll be the first to know. So he, we organised to get the book sent up, um, which was written by Johnny and Leo Moynihan. Fantastic book. And that came up last year, about a year ago, actually, with the promise that the documentary would follow. And then that trailer dropped this this week and it just looks absolutely tremendous. And one thing you do know is that it'll be done well because Johnny has the passion, not just for the three uh, figures in there, but he's got a passion for Celtic as well. So it's not as though because of the English football bubble, 
all the focus will be on Shankly and Busby. Steam will definitely be well represented in there and I'm looking forward to it. So he'll be coming up at two o'clock. So get involved if you've got any questions to ask uh, Johnny. Johnny's partner, obviously, is Vicky McClure, who um, acts alongside uh, another big Celtic man, Martin Compson, in Line of Duty, which is on my list of things I need to watch. I I've can't never, believe you've not seen that I've yet. never seen it. It's I brilliant. just watched Peaky Blinders, and that's been it for seven <laughs> years. Oh, so, no. Line of Duty is absolutely fine. It's on the list, Colin. Yeah. It's on the list. I'm currently watching Taboo, which has got um, Tom Hardy in it. That oh, was on right, the back okay. of watching Peaky Blinders. Anyway, we, we digress slightly. <laughs> um, the lead question is, who do we start on the left-hand side uh, against Rangers on Saturday? We just brought in Laxalt, who, you know, again, like everybody else, I've been looking at all the footage online, very excited by his arrival. He's got 90 minutes under his belt and a bounce match against Motherwell. But Taylor has been playing particularly well. I think the key to this is that Taylor is definitely a defensive player. He's defensive-minded. Mm -hmm. And that's where his attributes uh, undoubtedly lie. Like Salt, when you look at him as an attacking force, as an offensive player, for me, is going to give Rangers far more problems. On the back of that, I still have concerns that one more centre-half down and we might even have to set up differently to yeah. face Rangers. Colin, what's your thoughts? Who would you start with? So, I mean, I've toyed with this all week and I think we spoke about it at the start of last week when we were talking about predicted teams and predicted 11s. There was going to be so many things that were out of our hands that could happen between then and now. Um, and I'll probably just go with my team. I've actually come out with nine subs on the bench as well. I've been pretty prepared for this one. So I'm going with Barkas and goal. Mm -hmm. Frimpong, Ayer, Duffy, Julian. Mm. McGregor, Brown and Cham, Moy and Griff up front and at left back to answer the question of today, I've went with Taylor. Left back rather than left wing back? I think, I what's, think your, what's your formation? Your, ta your tactical formation, do you start with them as full backs? I wouldn't personally because I think their full backs are a danger. Well see that's where a lot of their attacking play is going to come from. So for me throwing like salt into a game like that although he's played the 90 minutes against Motherwell could be a sort of baptism of fire for him and I, I'm not sure it's a good thing to go in especially in a season that means so much like this with an unknown quantity so for me Taylor's best season sorry best game this season was against Hibs and the reason that it was his best game was he managed to keep Martin Boyle at at bay for 90 minutes he showed his defensive qualities as well as still being able to get up the park I think we'll look to try and hit Rangers on the counter um, on Saturday and I think having Ellen Ousey and Griff up front is a good combination there it offers pace it offers power um, and even if we only get 60 minutes out of Griff then I think it would be the best thing that we could do Would you expect any more from Griffiths? I mean we've been talking about the striker situation this week as well and the fact of the matter is, Klamala is the fittest Celtic striker we have of the four. Mm -hmm. Eduard obviously has uh, been battling the coronavirus. I think it's unlikely that he's going to be part of the, the game. I've got him on my bench just in case. He'll be back on Friday, I believe. It was meant to be. I don't know what the scenario is going to be. Lennon spoke at the press conference yesterday um, about the players that were recovering from the virus. Um, and he was mentioning uh, Ryan Christie's at a treadmill sent to his house um, to, to keep his fitness up. I wonder if he uses it as a clothes horse as well. I, if, if <laughs> the last time we get a video inside Ryan Christie's house, it wasn't the cleanest or the, the tidiest, um, so it could be. Um, but I, I actually don't even... Do you know what? I'm, I'm hoping you've, for the... You've had a photo of the inside of Ryan Christie's house. Have you not seen the video that no. came out? There was a challenge set out by the SFA over the summer. Right. It was a keep you up challenge and you were to keep it up between the rooms. We had Christy and um, Dembele took part in it for Celtic. Did and it showed that? you inside Christy's house. And to say that, his, I think his girlfriend's an art student. Um, so it looked a bit like modern art inside the house just because there was things <laughs> lying about the place. Um, I've actually not got Eddie even on my bench just because... I'm hoping for the the best but expecting the worst here um, in the scenario that something will come about that he, he won't be around for the game. So at the bench I've got Bain, LaSalle, Ayeti, Turnbull, Johnston, Klamala, Soro, Welsh and Dembele. Has it been confirmed that Johnston is fit? He's back training. Yep. Um, looking at the, the clips that we've seen from Celtic's training sessions, he is back in, in there. Uh, and I think with... 
the likes of Christie missing out. Mm. Um, even if you only get 15, 20 minutes out of Johnston, it's definitely someone that you can turn to. Interesting uh, choices all round there, I think, because, you know, we're brought in and there's been a few pronunciations of uh, Laxalt on this podcast and uh, I believe that it's Laxalt with a silent T. But we'll see how the commentators deal with that on Saturday. <laughs> um, so you're, you're going to throw Johnston straight in there in the, on the bench. Mm-hmm. Um, we're also playing with Julien being thrown back in, first game since the Ross County match. Mm-hmm. And you're happy to play Griff up front even though he's only played 20 minutes. Do you see any of that as a risk, Colin? Or do you think that just needs must at this moment? Do you know, I think these games are built on risk. And I know I, I mentioned earlier I wouldn't throw Lasalt into us or Laxol or... Diego I wouldn't throw Diego in <laughs> for a baptism of fire but I think you can get away more with taking a risk towards the forward line is what you can in, in defence we, mm. we spoke about this in the Insomniac podcast earlier when you think of the, the howlers shameless plug well if you want you can watch it on Twitter Facebook and YouTube um, when you think about like football howlers over the years mm-hmm. it's always defensive mistakes it's always goalkeeper mistakes um, and when you look at players that made their debut that you remember, we spoke about this last week. We had um, Fernando Rickson, who played his debut at Celtic Park and was torn apart by Bobby Petta. Um We had um, the the fullback for Celtic. I've totally his name's totally forgot me. Scored the goal at Ibrooks where McGregor threw it into the back of the net. El Kaduri. El Kaduri. That's it. That's why we dropped Callum badge. on for first name badge. <laughs> um, badge El Kaduri. But it's guys like that that you remember if they have a bad game mm. because they are, tend to be the ones that make the mistakes that cost you. Whereas up front, if you have a poor game, then it doesn't seem to let the side down now and again. You know, talking about the unknown quantity, the baptism of fire, that can work the other way. What do you think, Callum, when you throw someone in who probably has no real knowledge, let's be honest, of the fixture, right? Because obviously when we talk about uh, Celtic as a global brand, which they undoubtedly are, and we talk about the uh, Derby game being one of the biggest derbies in the world, really how relevant is it in Uruguay? Really how relevant is it in Milan, right? Let's be honest here. Does it really mean anything other than the fact that it's an important game for him? It's his first start, it's his debut. Does it matter if it was Rangers, Aberdeen, Livingston or Hamilton, really? And sometimes I think that can work in your favour uh, just by throwing the player in. It's an unknown quantity that Rangers need to deal with rather than an unknown quantity that Celtic have on their books. What do you reckon, Callum? Can you throw someone in and expect them to perform well in a fixture like this? I think this is a unique scenario because normally you would have a full, a full house, you would have an incredible atmosphere that could be intimidating for someone making their debut, um, particularly from, from abroad coming in on, on a loan spell. But... Because of the unique nature of this game and the fact that it's going to be behind closed doors, I actually think it's the sort of game that you can bed him in. And I think you've already referenced this, Paul. He's very good going forward offensively. Mm -hmm. Taylor, we're we're probably all in agreement, is is maybe a better defender. But in terms of the offensive nature of his game, Luxall has to go in if you want to trouble Rangers as fullbacks because they're very good going forward. Um, They provide a lot of assists. But defensively, they, they can be they can be got at. And I think that's something that will come in to, to Neil Lennon's thinking. If you're going to have a back five, um, again, that's all dependent on, on, on the COVID-4 not becoming any more. I think you will be tempted to throw him in because offensively, he will trouble Rangers going forward. And crucially, you'll have that stability at the back if you've got your three centre-halves and Frimpong tucking in while he's going forward and vice versa. So I think the, the nature of this game... Being behind closed doors would make Neil Lennon more inclined to put him in and and say to him, go and take your chance. Mm -hmm. The fact that it's behind closed doors was something that I spoke to Kevin Graham about on Monday. Kevin reckons that there is no occasion to be worried about because the fans make the occasion. It was an interesting point from Kevin and I totally understand that having been at several of these games and the, the melting pot that exists within the stadium when Celtic are playing Rangers. And, you know, does it affect players? Does it affect decisions of officials? I would guess it probably does. Colin, how big a part is that going to play in this game? How much different are we going to be um, viewing this game on Saturday? It's going to be an unknown quantity of a match. We've had games where there's been no Celtic or 
certainly one game where there's been no Celtic fans at Ibrox. And there's been a few games recently where the opposition's fans have been um, cut somewhat. But this is no fans. This is a ghost game. It's an interesting one. Um, certainly, I think for players that have played in this game before um, and players that were brought up on this fixture, I'm thinking about guys like McGregor, Brown, um, guys like uh, Taylor even. The Scottish core of the team really know what this fixture's about. Uh, and you've got guys that have been there for... Um, a number of years as well in both teams mm. that really know what this fixture is about and understand the importance of it. Um, so they will get it. Certain people um, who have came to Celtic and Rangers um, who haven't been brought up in this fixture, if it's this is their first time, like we're saying, that like maybe Diego will be his first time, then they won't maybe understand the full magnitude of what the game is because the game can be the worst game of football on the park for the whole season but it, there's so much build up to it there's so much atmosphere there's so much hatred on both sides as well and you, you experience that when you're at the cauldron of Celtic Park and you, you notice it when you go to Ibrox as well you, you, you feel the atmosphere there's almost like a, a different feeling in the air we're saying that's not going to be there when the players take to the field on Saturday mm -hmm. but there's still a professionalism in a lot of these players and there's a will and desire to win. And for me, that means that they can forget the fact that there isn't the 60,000 around them and still realise that Rangers are the team that we want to beat. And having that installed within each of the players' mentality will be a big thing ahead of Saturday. When you look at uh, some of the figures that you're referring to there, Colin, people like Callum McGregor, Scott Brown, and Neil Lennon himself, of course, mm -hmm. you know, preparing for his game as a new player. And of course, we've got six new players in the squad um, who will be making, five of whom may be making their uh, Celtic Rangers debut, their Glasgow Derby debut. And um, I don't think I've got any concerns about them being told of the magnitude of this game, them being prepared for what's their, what they're going to face. Now, you've given us your starting 11, your predicted 11 plus subs, mm -hmm. uh, Colin. Uh, what's your prediction for this Saturday? Do you see it being a cagey game where both clubs are trying to nullify each other's threats and uh, as a result of that, it might not be the best spectacle? Or will it go the other way? No, I think um, I don't hold out a lot of hope for it being a fantastic spectacle of football. Um, I think it will be a very cagey affair. Um, Celtic and Rangers will try and cancel each other's strengths out. Um, as you were speaking earlier, we, we spoke about Tavernier and Barisic, if they are the fullbacks on on uh, Saturday, we'll cancel them out the same way they'll try and cancel Frimpong. And if it is Diego that's playing on the left, they'll try and do the exact same thing to us. The middle of the park battle is going to be really interesting. Whoever wins the middle of the park battle will probably win the game, in my opinion. Um, if Brown and McGregor, and I've, I've put in Cham in there, I don't know who else would maybe slot in there, um, can kind of get on top of guys like Jack and Davis and Kamara then we, you've got the, the impetus, sorry, impotence see, a wee one for all the ones that were watching there that had a go at me last week impotence <coughs> um, and it's just about getting the sort of service up to the, the front too but for me I think there might only be one goal in it but I, I wouldn't, I'd be um, naive to make a prediction now no, one goal in it for who, Colin? Come on, get off the fence. <laughs> okay, one nil Celtic. Okay, right, glad we got that out on Callum. <laughs> Callum, I'm going to ask you for your predicted 11 in a moment, just to let you think about that if you haven't already prepared one. Um, I'm going for Barkas. This has changed two or three times over the last week for yep, obvious reasons. Yep. Um, central half trio of Julien, Duffy and Ayer. I've said previously, you know, uh, I think Duffy is bringing a solidity to Ayer's play as a defender. Um, you know, he's doing a lot of the defensive stuff now that perhaps, you know, he, he was good on the eye, Ayer. And a lot of the kind of the dirty work wasn't maybe being done. Duffy is instilling that in him. Julien is, is going to have to play. We have no real choice. If you want to keep the shape there, you're going to have to play Julien, even though he hasn't played in around a month. Uh, you've got to put him in there. Does he perform well against Rangers? I think he does. I think he, he rises mm -hmm. to that occasion Definitely, normally. Right. 
Um, I'm going to play with Frimpong down the right, one of the first names on the team sheet at the moment, with Laxalt down the left. Uh, again, just to attack the, the two fullbacks uh, of Rangers, with Brown and McGregor in the engine room, and Cham in front of them. One out and out striker in Griffiths with El Yunusi playing off him. And I think El Yunusi was playing last night, wasn't he? So, you know, he needs a couple of days to recover, but I definitely would start with him. So we have one change. That's the only difference. Mm -hmm. And that is the lead topic today is whether we play Diego or Greg. I'll just go with their first name. My subs are Bain, Ayeti, Klamala. I've got Eduard in there. I'm not sure 100% whether or not he's going to be available for selection. Tommy Rogic, um, Beaton is now Sorrow. Uh, El Hamid is going to be Welsh, mm -hmm. Turnbull and Taylor. So that's my starting lineup with a few changes. Um, what about yourself? What's your thoughts on how Lennon will line up? To be honest, Paul, it's very similar to you. Yours, Barkas and Goal, the back three in terms of the centre half picks itself and, and I are Duffy and Julian. Frimpong will start on the right and I think he will start Lasso. Um I think he will start on the left side because, as, I, as I've said in my previous answer, I think the fact it's behind closed doors, it will give Neil Lennon more confidence to put him in, even though it's going to be his debut in, in such a, a massive game, being the Glasgow Derby. Um, but I think he will put him in. In terms of midfield, completely agree with, with yourself and Colin. McGregor, Brown and Cham, I think, will be the, the midfield trio. Turnbull, obviously... Played well, uh, again, for the Scotland under-21s. I think he's a player who will be itching to get a start and would love to start in a game like this, but I think Neil Lennon will go with the tried and tested and charm in this situation. El Yunusi, um definitely will be behind. Lee Griffiths, I think, will get the nod because of the previous experience. And I think in a game of this magnitude, Neil Lennon knows he can hang his hat on him and he'll get a performance from him. However, a Yeti's an interesting one because... He's definitely got goals in him, as we've seen so far. So it'll be interesting to know if he's tempted at all to go with Ayeti from the start because he has played more minutes this season than Lee Griffiths. Mm. The interesting one, that just when I went through your bench there and it was someone I actually managed to forget about, was Tom Rogic. Um, obviously, he hasn't travelled as part of the international scene at the minute, so he has been at Lennox Town doing training. Um who do you think out of the two would provide a better service up to Griffiths? Because I think that would be the only kind of 50-50 there is, do you play Elanusi as a second striker with Griff up top? Because we know Griff can play as a lone striker and has been effective in that role. Or do you play Tom Rogic as a sort of attacking midfielder behind it? Someone that if you are struggling to get a grip of the midfield can then drop back again, but also has the ability to split a defence and play in Lee Griffiths? I think I would go with El Yunusi for the fact that Rogic simply hasn't had enough game time and this is the biggest game of the season, uh, undoubtedly. We know what Rogic can do. It was great to see him coming on against St Johnston, calling something that I'd been calling for, for <laughs> weeks and weeks. Um, but I don't think Rogic will be the surprise. It wouldn't come as a major surprise to me if... Lenny picked Clamalla up front. I think that might be the surprise. Mm -hmm. I, I'm taking it for granted Griffiths, but he's only got 20, 20 minutes, really. I know that he's had the bounce game against Motherwell and then previously the friendly against Hibs. But with 20 minutes, do you throw him in? Or is he a weapon for the last 20 minutes, the last half hour? It's an interesting point um, because we, when we were doing the St Johnston game, um, we, were, we were kind of talking about that and Lawrence was mentioning how um, Klamala's got a fantastic goal record I think it's like a goal every 30 minutes or so but I think he's only made one start this season um, the rest of the times it's been coming off the bench and we, we did mention that we thought he could be an impact sub for Celtic this season mm -hmm. something that is a fantastic asset to have so in that sense and when I go back to talking about players that really understand the game and have that passion for this match um, if you play Griffiths up there for 60 minutes you know that no matter what kind of condition he's in, he will run his socks off for 60 minutes as well. Um, and if we're up to that sort of speed of the game, you know Klamala can almost make that instant um, sort of impact. So that's the reason why I would start with Griffiths, so even though he's only played the certain yeah. uh, amount of minutes this season. It's just You just want someone that's maybe tried and tested um, and someone that really understands that what is needed in a game like this. And I think Griffiths running at that back two that they've got can cause them a lot of problems on the point there about um, 
Polish Paddy as he's uh, become <laughs> affectionately known amongst the Celtic support um, he has made one start as you quite rightly said he scored three goals for Celtic this season and if you add up all his minutes he's scored a goal every 83 minutes so not as impressive as every oh, half hour but it. certainly a, a goal every game a, mm-hmm. a goal every 90 minutes so he is a goal threat and that would be my that'd be my my big surprise it would be if if he was thrown in you've also got a Yeti again mm-hmm. but I don't think he's as effective playing as an out and out striker I think he would prefer to have someone up there does he play with two up front well there was someone I, I've put on the bench that I don't think has really been mentioned in recent times but I have seen him Anthony um, involved in tr- <laughs> <laughs> yeah from Listen, comes he out and in. Asked, he scored I heard yeah um, Karamoko Dembele now we see he's, he's back in training for Celtic and um, in the videos that Celtic have released he certainly looks to be part of the, the squad. I think he played in that game against Motherwell as well. Yeah. Um, you're looking at Frimpong coming down the right-hand side. He's going to be a target for Rangers on uh, Saturday. I've no doubt. They are going to try and take him out at every opportunity because they know he is an attacking threat and that's what they want to nullify. We are probably going to need to bring him off at some point because... I'd be surprised they'll boot him all over yeah, the park. I'd be surprised if he can make it through the ninety minutes without either picking up an injury or just being absolutely knackered from the amount of times he's had to pick himself up. Mm-hmm. So, who else is really out there? As you mentioned Ralston. I don't think he'll be on the bench on Saturday. So, it's Dembele is the kind of only other option at playing there, but he's not really defensive minded. Right, I've, I've thrown in Ralston's name. No disrespected boy. Have a think about this, right? If, for example, there's an injury, if, for example, Julian goes out and pulls up with a bad back that he's obviously been out nursing, right? We really are limited at the back. Mm -hmm. If he needs to go to a a back four, we have no right back. Uh, Ralston, at the moment, because Frimpong, I'm sorry, is never a right back, right? So Ralston is effectively the only fit right back that we've got. The the name I'd throw out there is Chrissy Ayer. He's playing at right back. Uh, I mean, it's not ideal, but if she had Ayer or Ralston, I'd probably go with Ayer. And You'd I, play someone out of position rather than play. I, I know it's it's a it's a hard one, but Tony, seeing the the, the times that we've seen Ayer at right back, mm. he has been very effective. I mean, again, I love mentioning this because it's so good. The wee flick out to El Hamid for the St, the goal against uh, St Johnston yeah. was outstanding when he played there um, at Pitodri. Um, where he scored the goal from the right back position uh, and he played there at Fur Park against Motherwell again where he scored um, so he has been proven to be effective out there mm. it's not the ideal scenario we don't want to play him at right back as we've all agreed today that we have a, a three of Ayer, Duffy and Julian but if that becomes a potential issue with Frimpong um, during the game I, th- I can see him moving Ayer out there and going to four at the back for anyone who's just tuned in, I'm not actually lobbying for Anthony Ralston to start against Rangers. <laughs> what I'm saying is, he's the only fit right back we've got in the books at the moment. But interestingly, you brought up Ayer, he is very adaptable. I mean, he was a he was an attacking midfield player when we bought him. Mm-hmm. And um, I think, what age was he when he made his debut over in Norway? 15? 15, 15, 14 yeah, debut. Yeah. He came out and said, uh, over the last day or so, I haven't rushed to move on. So he was talking about the speculation linking him to AC Milan mm-hmm. and the fact that I think his previous agent uh, was very vocal in trying to get him a move. And obviously AC Milan's Paolo Maldini, one of the finest defenders in my lifetime, confirmed their interest. But he has come out and said he hasn't been pushing for that. So it's great, after the Kilmarnock game he was obviously dropped, it's great to see him back in. And I think he's benefiting massively from playing alongside Shane Duffy. Definitely, definitely I agree with you. Um, and something that you said earlier as well is something I'd love to ask Callum about is if we do pick up an injury now we've been kind of lucky that Julian stayed in Scotland Ayers came through the Norwegian camp um, and Duffy managed to avoid the players that picked up the, the virus in Somehow. the Irish camp yep. um, so it only really leaves us with uh, Stephen Welsh and he was on loan at Morton last season. And I know, Callum, you got to see quite a bit of Morton last season. What was he like when he? Because he played right back for Morton as well, didn't he? He did. He was he was playing at right back for Morton quite a lot of the time. And and at times he, he looked a bit uncomfortable on the right hand side. Um, going forward, he, he's not someone who's going to offensively trouble 
um, the opposition going forward. But defensively, he can do a job in there. Crucially, though, in a game of this magnitude, would you want to put that pressure on him? I don't think you would. But you're you're right in saying it's another option because I mean, Paul, you mentioned if, if Julien um, picks up an injury or, or is out for whatever reason, and you go to a back four. And you mentioned playing Ayer at right back. I mean, if Ayer goes to right back, who would be alongside Duffy? It would, it would have to then be Welsh, you would mm-hmm. assume. So there is a fair chance that he could be involved. For me, he's, he's far more comfortable as a centre-back than, than he is in the right-hand side. And and for me, that's where I think he will be best utilised, whether that's at Celtic or long-term in a loan spell or whatever. But definitely, he's more comfortable in the centre for me. Lots for Neil Lennon to consider. So let's have a look at uh, some of the comments coming through, Colin. We've got plenty of comments coming through on YouTube, Twitter and on Facebook. And as you quite rightly said earlier on, we're almost at 3,000 subscribers on the YouTube channel, which is where uh, all the broadcasts are archived. So if you want to keep up to date with what Axom are doing, get subscribing on there, please. Rory Grant on YouTube. I think uh, we throw a fell in at the deep and keep Taylor, I think that's Axalt, in at the deep, and keep Taylor as backup. Also, Griff should get a start. Definitely his main cohort depends on who's available. Cohort, I think it is. But uh, thanks for that, Rory. Uh, Who's available? Well, the thing for me is you've got four strikers who will be available, and the decision will be on Edward in relation to how bad his last 10 days or so has Mm -hmm. been leading into the game against Rangers. And, the, the you know, the well-being of that player is of paramount importance. Yeah. And if he can't play, he can't play. And that's, you're just going to have to lick your wounds. That is that position I'm all that concerned about because we do have options, options there. My biggest concern is Julian at the back. And you, you're talking about throwing in the youngster, uh, Welsh, you know, in a game like, like that. It can make or break young players. We've mm-hmm. seen it doing both. I could go right back to uh, Ben Casey uh, back in the day. You guys are just looking at me. <laughs> no <time>. idea. <laughs> <laughs> and a poor performance and uh, an extra time own goal ruined his Celtic career. Whereas other players come into a game like this and they just revel in it. Now, talking about unknown quantities, somebody just came into my head there who performed really well against Rangers and it was Enrico Anoni. Now, we had this issue of Brian Loudrop who, you know, Celtic fans will admit what a player he was. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was absolutely outrageous. And he wasn't a player that you disliked, you know, when you go into these games, you dislike players like Terry Hurlock, you know, for obvious reasons, or people who get in about the Celtic uh, players. And he he was a class player, but Anoni famously was able to, to put him in his back pocket. And was that due to the fact that he'd played in Italian derbies and he had played against, you know, players who were of a much higher calibre than Brian Loudrop. And that was Anoni's words. I mean, he'd played against Ruth Hewlett, Maradona, Baggio, Loudrop's bigger brother, Michael. Um, and he says that they were all much harder to play against. They then plays against Loudrop and he thinks that this is no problem. So if you get someone like Lassalt who has played in, uh, you know, international finals and he's played um, at the San Siro and in Serie A, throw him in. He'll have no issues whatsoever playing against Rangers. That's my my take on it. Yeah, I, I mean, I really hope that is the case. I mean, we are talking about, we're not talking about a, a young boy, do you know what I mean? I think he's, what, 25, 26, something along them lines. He was in the, the team of the tournament at the last World Cup. Mm-hmm. So there is obviously undoubted talent there. It's just a thing. I think when you see someone sign for Celtic, it's just you see them sign and you go, well, OK, I'll see them in three weeks' time when they eventually get a game. Um, we don't tend to throw players in at the deep end so maybe this is um, against the curve and something that we will see at the weekend Now you guys were talking earlier on on the Football Insomniac about bad signings I think was yes. one of the subjects and we started getting chatting about big money signings and uh, one of the ones I threw into the mix was um, Ollie Burke who had a short spell at Celtic Um very successful for him because he won trophies, etc. But obviously Neil Lennon came and decided I'm not going to play this guy because he's not going to be at Celtic next season. And I asked the question, in combined transfer fees, is he the most expensive Scottish football footballer in history? Because you reckon that his last transfer fee was 20 million? No. Uh, 15, 15 million. 15? And he's had a few of them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's had three big, big yeah. money transfers. So, I mean, anybody on there... Uh, watching this show who can confirm that. So he had a big transfer to Salzburg, 
a big one to West Brom and a big one to Sheffield United. Uh, where is he at now? Sheffield, yeah, Sheffield United, United doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. So you're talking 45 million quid, I mean, potentially. He must, he must be up there with the likes of Ross McCormack for the amount of money that he went for as well. Because for a spell, Stephen Fletcher was the, the biggest, wasn't he? His transfer fees. Um, he did went to, to Burnley, then Wolves and Sunderland all for, for quite big fees. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's incredible when you, it's Oli Ollie Burke, who isn't even in his mid-twenties yet, <laughs> and he's potentially moved for 45 million. I mean, I, it's incredible. I remember um, Scotland played um, against Israel in the Nations League. We seem to always play against Israel, <laughs> um, but it was at Hamden, and I listened to the game on the radio. Uh, for whatever reason, I was travelling at the point, and I, I listened to the game on the radio, and there was no half-time analysis. The whole half time was spent describing why Ollie Burke was not a football player. He was more of an athlete. And I totally understand that because we've got to a stage where Burke is like, what, 25, 26 again. And he lacks the basic things like a first touch or the ability to put the ball in the back of the net. He, he's a he's a sprinter at heart, in my opinion. I don't know what you think, Callum. I think the, the thing with Burke is it's the dreaded thing in football when you get the tag of the next so-and-so. And when he makes the move abroad, you get that tag of the next Gareth Bale, which I don't think helped him. The The thing that, that, that puzzles me with Burke is the fact that he's played in he's played in Germany, he's played in Spain, he was on loan at Alves over there as well. Mm-hmm. And you just think to yourself, there's got to be a player in there. There's got to be something that managers continue to see. Mm. Chris Wilder, of course, very highly rated down south, has clearly thought, I can sign him and mould him into something new, potentially. But as you say, Colin, a lot of the time, he seems like someone who you want to get in behind. You want to to, to try and really just run um, to, to exploit opposition defences rather than trusting him to, to, to finish when, when, when it matters. I mean, I remember Celtic's game against Livingston under Neil Lennon um, at home. It was a draw and, and Burton missed an absolute sitter that day. Yes. For me, that just summed up the fact that he's not a natural finisher and that's been seen for me wherever he's went. West Brom were a, a club that signed him for a lot of money and mm. they, they weren't particularly fond of him in the end and were quite happy to let him go. I said Salzburg earlier, I meant Red Bull Leipzig, it's easy to get them mixed up. And they're all um, the same people. Yes, uh, 23 years of age he is. Is that all he is? 23, yeah. So that oh. that's quite incredible. But again, I think that says more about the English game than the player. The and player's many, obviously got something for these teams to be buying yeah. them for vast sums of money. How many moves has he had at the age of 23? How many clubs is he on now? Well, I mean, permanent S- clubs, like we say, Forest, uh, Leipzig, West Brom and Sheffield United, with spells at Bradford, Celtic and Alaves as well. So that's a lot of clubs. The you know, thing is, he's actually built for Scottish football. When you look at the way Scottish football is, he is Remember built the game for at Tinkastle? Yeah, he was, well. he was brilliant. That was uh, Lennon's first game after. They'll always have Tinkastle. Oh, his assist that night, I thought he was going to take it himself when they put it on a plate. Um, and he was born in Kirkcaldy, so he's a fellow Fifer as well. Oh, maybe I'm that's why he never made it then. <laughs> I'm going to stand up for him. That's maybe why he never made it. But um, he is built for Scottish football. When you think on it, he's tall, he's quick. He's strong. It's exactly what they look for in a Scottish striker. He just can't score. No, he's a non-goal scoring uh, striker and there's quite a few of them around. Aye, it's decorating is commenting on YouTube. I wouldn't be surprised to see Taylor at left back and Luxall in left midfield. I don't think Neil Lennon will start with a three as he only has three fit centre halves. That's a good point and one mm-hmm. that we have discussed. What happens, obviously, if you start with that, um, any kind of injuries and then you're changing the shape. But again, you do have the personnel, even with the the COVID-4, as we're calling them, missing. Uh, you do have the personnel there to adapt as, as the game moves on, be that because they're getting some joy down one area of the park or if somebody gets injured. So I still think we've got the strength on the bench. Yeah, I, I'd agree with you. Um, but as, with the strength that we talk about is players that can come off the bench and change the game. It's not really going to be players that we can bring on to sort of solidify the game. Mm-hmm. If you're looking at some of the players that we've we've looked at and put on the bench, we talk about Welsh, we've got Sorrow in there, you're missing Beaton, you're missing El Hamid, you're missing the sort of defensive minded players. So what we've got on the bench is really guys that can come on and change a game. Guys like Ayeti, Turnbull, Johnson, Klamala, Dembele, 
all attack minded players if we're going to try and see this game out there's not really a lot of players in there maybe that's where Ralston does make the bench Do you um, stick by Dembele or do you bring Rogic in now that you realise that you've made an error? <sighs> I'll come back to that. <laughs> I, I I don't know if there's somebody that's not going to make it. It's going to be Johnson mm -hmm. because he's he's not played a, a game this season. I brought him in as another option on the left hand side, but you've obviously got Taylor and Lasalt there, or Diego, or however our Spanish correspondents are going to pronounce his name. But Rogic is someone um, who can again change the game, but not a defensive minded player. So if we are say one 0 up after. 85 minutes the the options to bring on there are Sorrow and Welsh um, and we've not really seen a lot of what they can do so I don't know if that's someone that you would turn to in that scenario Brian McLean um, on Twitter makes a good point arguably the easiest derby ever to make a debut with no fans so he would throw Luxall in if he's fit and I think that is a good point and now we were talking there uh, earlier on about uh, Ryan Christie and we mentioned that um, he will not be part of the squad even though he's fit he's not ill uh, but unfortunately he will not be clear to face Rangers and you're looking at the fact that he would be a definite starter he would have started that game absolutely no doubt about it there's uh, two kind of views on this from Celtic fans one view is that he doesn't do enough, he plays for Ryan Christie. The other view is when you look at the amount of creativity that he brings to the team, he's a, he's a definite starter. Um, so the question that I would have then, the big question, obviously you mentioned Roderick there, and I don't see him being anywhere near the starting lineup, is that creativity that, that Christie gives you, can you simply change him like for like with El Yunusi? Has El Yunusi got enough about him because you know let's be honest he's been hot and cold this season he's definitely better for me in the central position Colin but um, I've started with him would you be better starting off with someone else uh, maybe even a Yeti playing off a of Griffiths or Kamala I, I feel as if I say this to every question you ask me it's an interesting one Paul um, I think where the, the difference is there is um, if you were to play with the, the two recognised strikers as it would be with a Yeti or Klamala, then you don't have that option to, to maybe change up the formation if and when required. Um, with Elanusi, you know he can at least drop out to the left. You're looking at the, the team there, if you're going with uh, Elanusi, McGregor, Brown and then Cham, McGregor can play out on the right as well. Um, he's, he's played there before. So you can change that from a, a 3-5-2 to a 4-5-1 to a 5-3-2. You've got that flexibility there. But when you've got the two up front, it's not really interchangeable. You wouldn't put Griffiths out wide and you wouldn't ask a Yeti or Klamala to drop deeper. Um, so I guess Elanusi offers you kind of um, that option to change it up if you needed to get a, a grab hold of the game. Mm -hmm. Would you consider starting Turnbull in the sense that he's at Motherwell played in a freer role? And he's someone who can offer lots of creativity and really in each appearance for, for Celtic so far appears to be getting more and more confident the more he gets on the park. Is he someone that could seriously come into consideration in that position? Well, interestingly enough, just as you mentioned that, one of the, the points that came up from David Bradley, and I know you can't see the screen here, Callum, <laughs> so it's not as though you're just reading it. Uh, I would have Turnbull in. Uh, I'm a wee bit worried with Brown and Jack had him in his pocket the last twice. So... There's plenty of people asking for, for Turnbull to start. Again, it's another option. I do think that Lennon has a surprise up his sleeve uh, with these team selections. He always does. Absolutely. Know? Always does. And that surprise might be with a striker, perhaps being Klamala. Should that be a surprise? He's a fittest striker. Uh, Turnbull might be that surprise. Um, Could be Bain and goal. I wouldn't go as far as that. <laughs> <laughs> for Ralston. Who, Ralston the right back. <laughs> Well, the, the thing with Ralston is um, he was one of the forgotten men we spoke about, wasn't he? Um, he was. He was in the same category as people like Kundai Benyu at the beginning of the season and then he's played the bounce game. And you've got to remember, here's a young kid who came onto the scene pretty early. I remember seeing him at Celtic Park. Again, don't shoot me down if you're just coming on here thinking that I'm lobbying for the inclusion of Tony Ralston. We've done this really well today. But he's, he's disappeared from view. He's now part of the first team squad. And a couple of injuries down, he becomes your only right back. Simple as that. It is something that I've mentioned before, though. You do really want, in a season like this one, we're in five competitions this season. You're looking at having at least 
three players that can play in a certain position. Now, if you've got Frimpong playing right back, right wing back, um, and you've got Alhamid there as well, your third choice is Anthony Ralston. So if it comes to a point where Alhamid is out of the game, which he is, then Ralston moves from third to second choice. So it is a kind of natural progression. You're not going to see the third choice for each position on the bench every week. No. So it, it wouldn't be a surprise actually to see Ralston kind of make that step up. But um, we, we do need to utilise this depth of squad and the fact that we are going to be missing, I think it's like six players for the weekend, mm. then this will really show how strong a squad that we've got. But then that's my frustration with Dembele as well. He started off this season on the bench. He was one of the, the first 20 picks for the first team. Uh, circumstances um, uh, resulted in him being out of that squad. A couple of injuries later, you've only got Frimpong on the right-hand side to the point where I even mentioned the other week there um, that Klamala can play wide right. He has played there in the past. Um, he wouldn't be playing out of position, but you're actually scraping the barrel a wee bit to find someone else to back up Frimpong should he get injured or, or even mm -hmm. suspended. We've seen him getting sent off previously. Um, ordinarily, the backup was Dembele, but I think he talked his way out of that position. You're, you've got him back on the bench, but that's how the squad is so important. And even for young guys like Dembele, Ralston and Welsh, who have all been mentioned in this podcast, you're only two moves away for getting a first team jersey. Mm. You know, and I think when Dembele, if that penny hasn't already dropped, when it does drop, um, Lenny will just welcome him back into the fold as he has done previously with people like Lee Griffiths, Olivier and Cham, Roger when his transfer fell down, Chris Commons. And I think Lenny's very good at that man management style, Callum. I'm going to come over to you and ask you about that because, again, I don't think he gets enough credit for it. In terms of man management, when you speak to anyone who's played under Neil Lennon, that's the first thing that, that they tend to mention is the fact that he can manage players individually and he's got a great way of bringing players back into the fold who have been out of form or, or out of sorts, whether that be off the field. And, and you're right, I think as a manager, he doesn't get enough credit um, for the success that he's had. Um, you, you'll get critics who point to the spell at Bolton, but if you, if you look at Bolton at that era... I don't think some of the, the greatest managers in world football could have mm -hmm. could have coped with the hand that he was dealt down there. It was it was symbolic. In terms of the season, I mean, he's been criticised an awful lot so far, but the proof's in the pudding in the sense that the, the, the stats, sorry, show that Celtic haven't lost, and that's crucial in a season like this to have the consistency of form that you're not losing many games. Of course, you don't want to draw matches, but at the same time, you'd much rather a draw than, than a defeat in a season like this where every point is going to be crucial. And, and in terms of the credit that he gets, yes, he, he doesn't get enough credit for me. And I think a lot of the time, people still, I think, want to be drawn into to names in football. And I think mm. that happens with managers quite a lot. You mm -hmm. see that there's a certain name or a certain brand of football that's in vogue and we should go and get him or we should go and get this style. And I think sometimes you need to accept that you've got a manager with a pedigree of winning league titles and cups and in a season where league title is going to be king in many Celtic fans' eyes, you've got a manager who certainly knows how to deliver that. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with that. And um, I think you're right about profile, you know, manager's profile. Uh, the manager that we're going to be facing on Saturday, for example, uh, you know, where are we? Season three for Gerard mm -hmm. at Rangers. Yeah. Season three is undoubtedly his Rangers side. You can't say he's building a side. You're three years into the job. That's your side. Um, if the if his predecessors had gone two and a half or three seasons without a trophy, would they still be in a job? And it comes down to profile. That's the reason he's still there. You know, yes, they are a much stronger proposition than they were before. You know, pre Gerard, I would say that as a Celtic fan, I, I think the results uh, speak volumes when you look at them as well. It's not as though we're going into these games now uh, thinking, will it be four or five? Because there was a spell yeah. where you thought it was going to be four or five. And that was because we were light years ahead of them. And also because we had a, a manager in place who was far superior to um, his counterpart. We're now at a stage where He's done better than his predecessors, but I still don't regard him anywhere near the level, level of Neil Lennon. Um, and that just comes down to winning. It comes down to success and it comes down to trophies. Now, one thing we haven't touched on today, but we will mention it, Colin and Callum, because I'm keen to hear your views on this. Um, where else in the world would it even be a, a discussion? But um, John Beaton's in charge of the 
Uh, officials, he's the referee on Saturday. And I spoke to Kevin Graham about it. I, I feel there is a concern. I think he's a concern. The COVID casualties are a concern. And then you start thinking about uh, the team that you're playing. That you know, that's not me being paranoid. Um, how do you think? How important is it going to be on Saturday? Again, going back to absolutely no fans there. Um, and let's be honest, everybody has that uh, uh, that unconscious bias, and that can be swayed based on the pressure you put under, depending on that being 60,000 Celtic fans, 50,000 Rangers fans. That's not there. It's just John Beaton making his own decisions and he's not being swayed by a home crowd. That worries me. I think for, for John Beaton, I think as a referee, he, he, he won't say it publicly, but I think he'll be very relieved that he's going into this game on Saturday with no fans there. I think it's going to be a unique experience for him because anyone that's that's refereed a game of such magnitude has 50,000 or 60,000 fans being for their team to win. So I think he'll be relieved to be going into this game with no fans. But crucially, he's going to be under the microscope arguably even more because you know what it's like. We all know what it's like. You go to a game and you might need to watch the decision again when you go home because you didn't get the perfect view from where you were sitting. Whereas the fact that everyone's going to be watching this on television, or most people anyway, other than the journalists that are there, means that every single decision is going to be arguably under the microscope more than ever because everyone watching who's a fan of our Celtic Rangers is going to be getting the replays, getting things slowed down, and he's going to have to have a really strong game. Whether he can do that, whether he, that's going to be the case, obviously I don't know. I think for him, though, he will go in arguably more relaxed than he normally would or any referee would to, to a game like this because of the, the lack of a crowd. But what I would say in regards to John Beaton and, and referees in Scotland is it's quite a small pool to choose from. So I feel like it's the unenviable task, I, I, I feel, because there's only a select few that would be trusted with that game. And I think it, it gets to a point where John Beaton's finding this now where he's refereed it quite a few times and Craig Thompson, I, f I feel, used to find that as well. Mm -hmm. Celtic are playing Rangers or Rangers are playing Celtic. Craig Thompson referee. And I think there's a wee bit of that with John Beaton that's crept in because he has refereed it so often. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's something that can never be easy because in, in football, whether it's a player or a referee, mistakes will always be mentioned. So it'll be interesting to see, especially how he handles it, given the unique circumstances this time around. I think it touches on something that you just mentioned, Paul, is how close this game is going to be. And we spoke about how much Rangers have developed as a side. Now we know they were pretty much at rock bottom at times and were turning them over, four goals here, five goals there. Um, but now the, the, it's getting tighter. Um and the decisions that these referees make will could be the difference between winning and losing. Yep. Um, and I, I don't 100% buy into the fact that the, the referees going in there to deliberately make decisions. I think um, they, they don't want to, you don't ever want to turn up at your job and do a terrible job. Do you know what I mean? I know there'll be a lot of people out there that think that there's definitely a, an unconscious bias out there. Um, but it is because the game is going to be so close that John Beaton will be under the, the microscope as such and um, Celtic fans are going to say that the decisions lent one way, Rangers fans are going to say it the other way. Um, I just want to go out there on Saturday and beat them on the park no matter what John Beaton does and tries to do. Um, I just want Celtic to go out there and be the better team on the day. The concern I've got is you could be the better team on the day, Colin. Um, and if it is a tight game, when it's been refereed by someone who celebrates Rangers victories at Ibrox by going into a Rangers pub, that is a concern. Mm. That's not paranoia. That's not me howling at the moon. That's what happened the last time Celtic were defeated at Ibrox, won nothing and beat him as the, the referee. He was in a boozer celebrating with Rangers fans, getting selfies, all this kind of stuff. Now, they weren't photoshopped images. That no. happened. But do you think then that then kind of puts the pressure on him not to be as biased? Like if you're looking at a 50-50... Generally, if you do. If you're looking at a 50-50, for example, right, and it's Brown and Jack going in on each other, if, you, if, if, if you're him, right, and you're thinking, in the back of my mind here, it's going to be all over the front pages of the paper on Monday, these old pictures of me in a, a Rangers pub, mm. does that almost give you the, the kind of thing to go, I can't come across as being too biased. I don't know. Do you know, there's going to be a lot running through Beaton's head between now mm. and Saturday. In the same way, there's going to be so much running through Gerard and Lennon's heads over team selection. He, 
the the man that's going to be watched the most out of everyone that's on that park is going to be John Beaton and um, I, I don't envy him in the fact that he's got to do it but I, I just hope that he comes out with a professional performance I think it's one of those ones where the pressure, you're right, will be on him. As, as I mentioned, the, the fact that everyone's watching it at home arguably puts the referee under the microscope even more because everybody watching is going to have the benefit of replays rather than the, those in, yep. rather than those in the crowd having to second-guess decisions. So I think he will be aware of that. I, I'd be interested. I think the SFA will make him very much aware of that as Definitely. well because they, at the end of the day, no matter who they put in charge, they want that game to go smoothly, as they do with any game particularly when it's going to be broadcast in so many countries. So I think the pressure is on him as it would be in, in any any game. And, and you're right, Colin, I think there's, there's things that have happened in the past, been pictured in certain places, etc. Um, and I think he will be aware of the, the reaction to that. I think mm-hmm. he will be aware that it's something that does bring scrutiny in. And I think as well, he's, he's also been through the mill in the sense that he's had to have security accompany him to certain games. He's had his house targeted, etc. So... I think he's he's seen lots of different sides of the extreme when it comes to Scottish football and crucially I think let's be honest putting yourself in his shoes I think he'll just want to get out of there with as low key a game for himself as, as humanly possible. I no, think, sorry. I think one of the sorry just on that I think what he'll need around him is a strong team. He'll need his linesman to be on the ball as well. I don't know if it's going to be um, the the MP linesman that will be um, accompanying him at the weekend um, but things like offsides penalty decisions yeah. and all that if he's going to want to turn to his team um, to to give him support on that especially in a game of that magnitude because you just cannot get a decision wrong Now Colin this is the first day I've not changed my team which shows you the situation that we're in uh, with the coronavirus at the moment I have predicted 2 nothing Celtic. I'm going to say Duffy's going to open the scoring and um, we'll all go absolutely wild when it happens. You're going one nothing Celtic. Callum, what's your prediction? I'm going to go for 2-1 um, to Celtic. I think I think Rangers will score on the day, but I do think Celtic will will, will be victorious on Saturday. I think going into this game, I, I mentioned to, to, to Colin off air, if, there are another, if there's another one or two call-offs or it stays at the four, Neil Lennon's the sort of guy, you, you mentioned earlier, Paul, when it comes to man management, Neil Lennon will build a siege mentality going into the game and basically will we'll explain to the players we've been written off, people are saying we can't cope without him, him and him, let's go and prove our point. And, and I back Celtic to prove their point on Saturday and crucially I think Neil Lennon will be delighted to prove his point, especially in the press afterwards, because as I've said, he's been given a lot of stick this season from certain elements, whether that be Celtic fans or journalists, and I think he will want nothing more than to, to have a good, comfortable win on Saturday and explain to the to the press in no uncertain terms that he's doing a good job domestically this season. Absolutely. And again, I'm looking forward to it. Even though we've got a few bodies out, I'm still looking forward to it. We're going to be covering all the action from a state of mind studios half an hour before the game at half time and for 30 minutes after the game we're also going to give you an extra bulletin on Friday night that will be running from around 8 o'clock where you can all tune in and let us know your views the night before the big game we've had loads of comments coming through on Twitter Facebook and YouTube if you haven't already please subscribe to a Celtic State of Mind on the YouTube channel because we are heading towards 3,000 subscribers might even run a competition and give out some prizes and Ooh. things like that Colin if I can dig some prizes out from the uh, State of Mind studio uh, at 2 o'clock I will be interviewing Johnny Owen who was one of the co-authors of this book which has just been adapted into a documentary if anyone has seen the trailer out there you'll be excited this is the three kings the makers of modern football all that's left for me to say today is Colin Watt Callum McFadden thanks for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind